So I want to officially start uh, our meeting and uh, I want to welcome all of you. Uh, thank you so much. I am uh, the artistic director of Grand Piano Series and we are based in Naples, Florida. And uh, we present concerts uh, in this area. However, we did start an active online uh, engagement program. So um, this is part of our online offerings. And I am thrilled uh, to have a dear friend, uh, a colleague, um, Eugenia Zuckerman, join us today. And um, just a brief um, uh, history uh, about my knowing Eugenia and how we know each other. Uh, we met in 2008 and uh, Eugenia and I uh, have traveled across the country uh, in many different places where we performed as a duo. We also performed um, as a trio and a quartet in different chamber music settings. So uh, it's, it's been really an exciting time touring together and uh, seeing and, and, and uh, Eugenia, actually, I was thinking about our conversation yesterday and kind of looking back to, you know, our time together. We had some really exciting trips, you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> we had some funny moments, you know, uh, Yesterday you mentioned, yes, we got pulled over <laughs> on, on a highway uh, a couple of times. Uh, I was usually the designated driver. I was the one driving the car uh, and making all the arrangements and so forth. So sometimes not being aware with different state laws, you know, uh, like turning on the lights uh, 30 minutes before the sunset. I mean, who knew, right? So in And Milana, yeah, I remember the, the funniest one that I remember is I had gotten a car finally and I was driving it and we were going up a hill and suddenly behind me, someone was honking and I was saying to Milana, what's going on? Why well, is honking? And she said, pull over, there's a policeman. <laughs> so I pulled over and the policeman said to me, uh, asked about the car and I said it was, you know, brand new and I'm just learning to drive. And he said, what do you mean you're just learning to drive? <laughs> and uh, he then said, why didn't you stop? And I said, well, because you were behind me and you were honking at me. <laughs> so this was my initial uh, first, in, in, you know, first contact with the, with the driving a car. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I remember. I, th I think uh, it was a taconic uh, highway uh, that we were stopped and, and nobody was around and it was 55 miles an hour you have to drive. So... It's kind of strange to drive on an empty highway, which you know, is beautiful, of course, but 55 miles an hour. <laughs> so <laughs> not noticing that speed limit anyway. Eugenia, so thank you for tuning in. And um, I think some of our listeners are familiar with your work and, and, and your career, uh, but um, quite a few probably are not. So I would like to just kind of... Uh, briefly go well it's impossible to do it briefly of course because <laughs> you had such a have such a, a, an incredible life and so many careers um and and, and it's quite remarkable but uh, considering that music has been such an important um element in your life i want to go back and uh, can can do you remember the time where you felt that you wanted to become a musician, that this was your calling, and this is where you would like uh, to go career-wise? Well, it was really very early on. Um, I uh, was at uh, grammar school, I think maybe third grade, and uh, members of the Hartford Symphony came to our school and demonstrated their instruments. And for the first time, I heard a flute played. And I actually ran home after school and said to my mother, I, I have to play the flute, please. Can I play the flute? I, I must. And um, 
Both of my parents were very musical. My father played the piano, my mother also. And so they were delighted. And I was able to get uh, lessons at school and also because my parents uh, got me private teaching. And I have to say, the flute has always been what I would call my other. It, um, it, it, se it seems always to be there for me in different ways. And I think it was terrific for me as a very young kid uh, learning the flute because no matter what was happening outside, if I had had a fight with a kid at school or I wasn't, you know, wasn't happy with this or that, I could always go to my room and have my other or my best friend with me. And I still feel that way. I mean, here I am at the age of 75 and it is still something I get up every morning and practice. And um, it has kept me, I think, very, very centered in certain ways. And I also think it's so important for kids to l really learn how to play an instrument, even if they only do it for a short amount of time. It is, um, you know, something that uh, doctors are saying that uh, learning an instrument early on uh, is very, very helpful for many things. As a young person, and when you were auditioning uh, and applying for schools and, uh, and uh, colleges, did you ever have any doubts? Um, should I do music? Should I be going into the music field? Or was it something that you were absolutely certain that this is your calling and this is your destiny? I can't say that because when I went to Barnard College uh, at first, there was so much uh, in New York to get involved in. And it was clear to me that I wanted to keep playing music. Um, and at the same time, I was able to meet people who wanted to play music with me. Uh, and at that time, I had, um, you know, the uh, trying to think of what it's called, um, uh, when you are, uh, you're being taught, not by being taught, sorry. Was it like um, an exchange program or a double degree or? Uh, well, it, I went to Juilliard. Uh -huh. uh, I started at Barnard and I realized I really want to play uh, professionally. Mm -hmm. So that was, at first I was going to Barnard and Juilliard and then I, I, I transferred to Juilliard mm -hmm. and, th and then it became very clear to me that this was for me and what I wanted to do and had to do. Mm -hmm. And um, so just uh, remembering, you know, I, I mentioned in our pre-conversation, the young concert artist, um, but ha for example, you have be, you know, you won the young concert artist, right? And do you remember if there was a big change for you from that point on, career-wise? Yes, uh, a big change, because when you win one of these competitions, and they are competitions, um, you are taken care of in uh, a very special way, especially with, um, uh, with the, the agent, which was... No, who was I? Sweetheart, help me. Well, Julius Baker was my teacher, right. and I had all my lessons with him. But it was young concert artists that I auditioned for, and they took me out. So that was uh, that. That was the, the biggest boost that I got, really. And young concert artists would take their um, players, and we would be sent off to everywhere across the country. And um, that was a wonderful way to learn, not only about um, performing on the road, 
but behaving on the road and getting through difficult things. I mean, you know, you have a, a, a tire blowout on you and you have to get to a place and get there to the first time, you know, to in time to uh, have the concert. So I think the early years of becoming a traveling uh, performer was, uh, was, was a real lesson in, in so many ways. Well, it's interesting because um, I think a lot of our audience um, members, you know, they have sort of this romantic idea of what the touring life of a musician is, right? And and uh, so we go on stage, uh, we are stars, right? But very few people really know what's going on behind the scenes, right? Exactly. Uh, and what just happened, yes, you might have dealt with a, you know, tire just two hours ago and, and your mind is not quite, you know, focused on trying to perform the concert, right? Right. And then the green room, the, the green room and, and so much going on in the green room, right? We are there right before the concert and the devils are joining us in our head, right? I, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I agree with you completely because it's it's st standing around with your instrument. Everybody body is noodling on their instrument. Uh, there's cacophony in the green room. And then you kind of wonder, uh oh, do I have this? Do I have that? Is my skirt zipped up? Is, you know, there's a lot to think about. But um, I have to say that Young Concert Artists was a real gift to me to be able to be chosen to be part of it. And uh, Young Concert Artists is, uh, is, is sensational. And Susan Wadsworth, who began it, um, really uh, created something that it is, is magnificent still. Right. I want to talk a little bit more about... Um our profession as an artist, right? And what it takes to be an artist. And for example, what would your advice to young people these days would be, you know, who are choosing a career in, in performing arts? This is a difficult thing for me to really answer because I am not teaching and I am... Um, you know, I, I'm traveling, so it's hard for me to assess really what I could tell people to do. I think that uh, young people uh, generally are very passionate about their instrument to begin with um, and, and the music. So it's difficult for me to say this is how they should do it or how, what they should do. Um, I think understanding the amount of work you have to do as a beginning artist. Uh, a lot of people drop by the wayside because it is difficult. Um, and I remember learning the flute. Uh, my father had a, a way of making me want to, to play by, he had uh, two cups of uh, cups uh, on the, I guess on the piano or something. And every time I would practice something, uh, I would move one cup to the other. So I would know that I had done it. And this was when I was a very young, young girl. And uh, so it, um, you know, going from that experience as a very young artist, um, you know, you, you get to know, how to wait on tables. You get to know how to, uh, you know, after a concert, uh, chat with people. Uh, it's, a, it's there's, there's a lot that is involved in having a career. Well, for sure. But I think probably the most important is the attitude that we go on stage with, right? And... Uh, when I said we have many devils in the green room, I mean, um, I personally don't know any artist who is 100% confident in going out on stage at that moment, right? And so we are in the green room, we are fighting uh, 
sort of for our right to be on stage in a way, right? Because there's so much doubt, even no matter how how much you're preparing, right? How well prepared you are. Um, well, I have to say, sorry to interrupt you, yeah, but I have to yeah. say that I know, and I did know uh, early on, uh, that, that there were certain people who were just totally confident and could march out there. Um, I was married to one of them, you know, who never had a problem, you know. Uh, so I think that uh, demons are everywhere in everyone's life. <laughs> <laughs> there are things that you have to worry about. But um, I, I think one of, the, one of the benefits of being a musician is you also learn how to get along with a lot of diverse personalities. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just thinking of you and me uh, and the many concerts that we did together with many other people. And uh, you and I could talk about it afterwards and uh, and in those 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 kinds of trips that you and I took, I, I found them really enormously helpful because we could really talk very uh, openly about how we had played and um, and we I think we both learned. Yes, it's interesting that uh, I'm. I'm uh, I have some conversations with uh, artists and the audience and the audience would, would come and say, oh, it was such a fantastic performance. It was so remarkable and, and great. And as an artist, I think we go back into our room and we know exactly what happened in that performance, right? So, you know, we how many mistakes we did or what it is that we did. And it's, it's sometimes difficult. I don't know if in your case, but I, I think it's sometimes it's difficult to accept um, the praise, right? Because you you are aware of what is happening, right? And um, there's constant battle. You know, we're mm -hmm. constantly battling between you know being on stage and, and saying thank you, and at the same time, um, you know, going back and saying, oh, I have to practice on this, 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 and this. Right. <laughs> so. Well, backstage, I think uh, is a. It's like a hornet's nest. Everybody's buzzing around, etc. And things can happen at the last moment. I can re remember, you know, zippers not working, and going out on stage and sort of tripping over something. It's, uh, you know, get preparing for the concert is uh, as almost as difficult as actually playing. Mm -hmm. I'm not seeing you or hearing you now. Can you? Uh, well, because uh, can you see me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, Eugenia, how did you get interested in um, being arts correspondent and uh, joining the CBS Sunday Morning team? I got a phone call from someone who said, uh, "Hello, Eugenia Zuckerman. This is oh gosh, I wish I could remember his name." Uh, because he was the head of a head of head of um, CBS Sunday Morning, mm -hmm. he said, "I have a job for you. Going, uh, I have a job for you. You're going to do it. You're going to love it." And I said, "Who are you?" And that's how it happened. Uh, and I, uh, you know, went and talked to the CBS people, and I had um, no experience really doing uh, in depth. Uh, conversations with other people, but this was a, a great gift for me, uh, just an amazing gift for me, because I was able to talk with some of the greatest artists of our time and learn so much from them, traveling across the country to go hear people. Uh, it, it was 25, more than 25 years with CBS Sunday Morning. And it wasn't the only thing I was doing by any means. So it was, um, I, you know, my plate was always full. And I'm very grateful for that. That's very important because uh, you are a mother. You have two beautiful daughters. You were a performing active artist. You were on CBS Sunday morning. You're writing. How do you juggle all of that you know and at the same time i think later on you were also arts administrator right so you added even more to your plate how did you get through this 
I don't really know, <laughs> day by day. But um, I think that I, I, I had a real appetite for the things that I did. Uh, I, I, don't, I, I was careful really not to take something on that I knew I really wasn't interested in or felt I could do. And sometimes I took on things I shouldn't have taken on because I, I wanted to push myself and say, gee, do, you, do I think that I can really handle uh, a bunch of people uh, as in um, the, uh, the uh, I'm talking about the, um, the, the, the uh, veil, artistic, <laughs> artistic term. Excuse me, everyone. You know I've got a problem. Okay. <laughs> um, so Vail, uh, to be the artistic director for that, was, uh, was a challenge and, yes. and learn a great deal from it. Well, th it, it's a major um, organization, right? And, and there are hundreds of people, musicians that you are coming across with, right, and dealing with. And not only musicians, the board, the administration, the, everybody. So... Mm -hmm. It's yeah. I'm 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 just thinking. It's it's must have been very interesting job, um, but at the same time, probably not easy. Well, I got the New York Philharmonic to come to Vail, <laughs> and uh, that that was a real coup for me. And uh, there there were so many people who helped also, you know. And I I think that um, I learned a great deal. I. I feel that I was just very lucky in many ways. And, and, and again, for me, I, was, I felt always very centered when I had a flute in my hand. And I still feel that way, you know, to be able to wake up in the morning and instead of thinking, oh, what, what should I do today? I know what I'm gonna do today. <laughs> I, I always do. And I also feel uh, quite a number of flutists of my age, and, you know, I, I'm 75. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, you know, you, it, it gets harder and harder, but you do it. Yes. Um, so now that, you know, you are where you are, uh, last time I saw you was last September, mm -hmm. and uh, we had a concert together with my trio, Manhattan Piano Trio, and you at on your series. And it was really lovely to see you, and I very much enjoyed our morning walk uh, in the countryside. So you took me out to show me around, and it's just such a beautiful countryside. And as we were uh, talking, uh, you mentioned that you have written a book and it's about to be released. It was uh, releasing a month and a half later. Falling through a cloud, like falling through a cloud. And about your diagnosis. Um, diagnosis. And, diagnosis, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> diagnosis. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I could count on you for that. Because <laughs> I'm the one who has it. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, what I'm interested, and I think probably some of our audience uh, also is interested, uh, first of all, the very beginning, how did the conversation start with your family? Because I would assume that the conversation started in your family for you to get diagnosed. Well, my daughters kept saying to me, you're, you're mixed up, I don't understand what you're saying. And it was my daughter, Natalia, who said, you're going to come with me and we're going to have you tested. And I said, tested for what? You know, I was, uh, in many ways, I was in the poppies about the fact that I was not always very clear, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I was in a sense of real denial. Uh, and I went with my daughter. I went and was tested. And uh, it was clear after talking to this extraordinary doctor um, that I began to realize, you know, I, I do have Alzheimer's. And um, 
that afternoon, well, first of all, the, the ending of my very first meeting with, uh, you know, being tested was that uh, I was taken downstairs for an MRI. And I probably am the only person that you know who really loved the MRI. I loved it. I don't know why, but, you know, I was there, you know, in lying on uh, uh, a mattress and hearing these, what I thought were really fabulous sounds. <laughs> Other people <laughs> said, you're crazy. And I'm probably in. But, but anyhow, uh, I got through all of that. And, uh, and I went back home and uh, I went into my apartment, sat down at my desk and stared at the wall. And for some reason, I, after a while, picked up a uh, pencil and paper and started writing. And it all came out in poetry. I have, had written quite a bit of poetry, um, but this all just somehow came out in verse. And uh, it, it uh, yeah, <laughs> my husband said, it's like falling through a cloud. <laughs> and, <laughs> And I'm still falling through the cloud. <laughs> yeah. So um, that's how how the book began. And I didn't show it to anyone. After about 25 pages, I asked my daughter, Natalia, could she look at it? And Natalia said, well, mom, this is really something. You have to keep going. And I was, I just kept going. It, it was something that uh, I didn't really know where it would go where what what it would be but I was really um the, telling the story of my uh my disease yeah no it's it's a it's a fascinating journey and I think um most of the people uh at least from my ex limited experience that you know those people that I know they don't necessarily go through a creative process, right? So there is a lot of anger and a lot of um, difficulty accepting that uh, something like that could be, you know, happening to them. So, um, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. So I, I think it's 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 important um, for many uh, to to hear your story how you are dealing with that and, and what it is helps you to go through uh, uh, on this journey. And it is a journey. And if you don't mind uh, reading some of your poetry to our listeners, that would be really wonderful, I think. I would love to. I would love to. Um, and I want to say how delighted I am to be here and those listening uh, these are uh, thoughts and, and feelings that I've had for a long time. But um, uh, before I forget, I want to let you know that I do forget. I have Alzheimer's disease. It's a difficult diagnosis, but I believe the trick with any difficult diagnosis is to stay positive and to live every day with a hopeful outlook. And of course, I've written a book about it called like falling through a cloud and it's available at amazon or bookshop.org in hardcover or audiobook with me reading it um, it's a lyrical memoir mostly written in verse and it's been i'm glad to say very enthusiastically received so now i would like to read from my book like falling through a cloud sometimes when i wake up it's dark where am i Sometimes I know, and sometimes I have no idea. So I let the night spirits wrap around me and they whisper to me, don't think, you will remember. I lie very still. And then suddenly, like falling through a cloud, I know I am here. Forgetting, I told you, you asked me that already. Don't you remember? What is wrong with you? How many times do I have to tell you? Why don't you listen? Are you okay? Don't you recall? Are you losing it? I think you're losing it. You need a doctor or something. You need some help. Words. 
They taunt me, tease me, test me when I fail to find them. I know they're hiding somewhere in the dark realm of my cerebellum, floating around, mocking, sneering, shouting. Catch me! Remember me! Speak me! Sometimes it's wise to wait, wait for one word or the kernel of the word to explode like popcorn and leap onto my tongue, bringing others with it, stringing a sentence together for me to speak. And I say it, all the words in the right order, spilling out of my life, uh, sorry, spilling out of my mouth. And my brain asks me, okay, was that so freaking hard? Marbles. Maybe mine are lost, or maybe they're rolling around in my head looking for a place to land, or maybe not. My daughters tell me to get tested. Tested for what, I ask, even though I know for what. But it's for what I don't want to know, so I let the marbles roll around in a swirl of distracting colors because I don't want to listen to them, the daughters, because if I hear them, I will be very afraid, and this mother, cannot be that mother, not ever, never. Getting it together. I've made a date with my banker because I hanker to know where things stand when it comes to what I'll hand to my next of kin. So I should begin to keep track of stuff to see if there is enough to pass around when I'm under the ground. I'm not being dramatic, but I can no longer be static about what lies ahead when I'm dead which oddly, I do not dread. Instead, I want to avoid leaving a mess for the family to assess. I'd like them to say she left it this way to keep trouble at bay and to avoid a fray. I don't expect to croak at midnight stroke, but I don't want to be 103, which my mother achieved. I will stick with the plan I've made with my man. When the time seems right, we will have the delight of donning deer suits on the first day of hunting. And we'll go out in the fields and wait to meet our fates. Only, I hope the hunters know how to shoot straight. I will leave you with one more piece, the last from my book, Like Falling Through a Cloud. A super sunny Sunday, almost August, and the tomatoes are bulging on their vines. The flowers continue to burst toward the sky in colors that astound. While on the ground, our once hearty kale has been ripped out by rabbits who attack at dawn and are gone in a flash, leaving the crop tattered and torn. Nothing lasts forever, not kale or tomatoes or cucumbers or the glorious flowers that fill our fields or the people we adore. And though I know my days are numbered, I feel unencumbered by thoughts of my demise. I do not embrace my inevitable decline, but I'm determined to find a way to make the rest of my stay on this problematic planet filled with light and love and music. As for the deer suit I promised to don, I don't think I'll put it on. Not now, not yet, I'm not ready, I feel steady. And I have a strategy to keep on keeping on, which is simple. Wake up, fetch the flute, summon up syrinx, give thanks for another day, and then play on, play on, play on. Bravo. Thank you so much. This is just so beautiful, really incredibly beautiful, heartfelt honest poetry and um i'm i'm grateful you're sharing it with us well thank you i i if you don't mind there was one thing that you know i i've been sort of wondering you know am, am i is this a good thing that i'm doing going around and does it who does it help and um at one of my book readings uh after uh, people were standing in line to have books signed there was a man who had uh, who bought six copies uh, to give to his family, and he told me that he had Alzheimer's but could never find the words to describe what he was feeling to his family, and that hearing what I had to say helped him and his family enormously. 
because I think one of the greatest problems with a family that has one of its members uh, with this disease, this diagnosis, is to uh, make the person who has the disease not feel uh, isolated. isolated. Yeah, you, you, you feel isolated and you go into a corner and um, it's, it's, I am so fortunate that I have a family that has really stepped up to the plate and has really helped me enormously in so many ways. And um, I, I have never felt sorry for myself. And I feel that um, to feel sorry for yourself means that uh, you've given up. And I don't even think about giving up. Um, I continue to write. Uh, I continue to play concerts. I'm the artistic director of Clarion Concerts in Columbia County. And I just want to keep going. And there's so much ahead, I think, if one can really remain positive. No, you're um, really opening up a very um, different world, I think, to many listeners. And you have commented correctly about uh, the communication of the family and the person who has the disease, right? And um, what a great advice is not to make the, the person who is <clears throat> diagnosed with um, with the disease feel isolated. Yeah. And um, thank you for sharing this. Uh, very, very grateful. And um, I want to open up now. Uh, we have wonderful audience. I'm sure they have questions. And I already have one question in the chat that I would like to read to you. Uh, it comes from uh, Ben. Uh, and uh, he's saying, you're terrific. My wife had Alzheimer's. Could you comment about music therapy and Alzheimer's? You know, this is really a wonderful thing that has been brought up because it is a wonderful therapy uh, to be able to play music for someone who perhaps doesn't do it themselves, um, to be able to um, to uh, speak a second language. Speak, sorry, speaking a second language because music is a second language, really. And learning how to play anything, uh, any instrument, uh, is, it can be enormously helpful to an Alzheimer's patient. And um, you don't have to play it well, but it, it, uh, it is something that you can do to help your memory. And Eugenia, do you find um, uh, that your musical memory um, is, um, I don't know how to say it, but what I'm, I mean is your memory of words and memory of sounds and music, is it different? Do you, do you feel that there is a difference or it's, let's say, when you forget, you also forget the music? Well, that's a very good question because um, it's it's difficult for me to always find the right words. In fact, um, at this stage of my disease, I am losing words, uh, and it, I I do keep I I don't beat myself up about it. But um, one of the reasons is because my fabulous husband uh, has a great sense of humor and always can make me you know, buck up when I need to. But um, I have always needed to read music. Um, I've never been able to memorize easily. And I used to beat myself up about that. You know, how come you can't do it? And probably that was a very early, uh, uh, I can't say reminder, but an early phenomenon. phenomenon that was going on in the brain. So I, I think that my, um, my loss started much earlier than I, I think it did. And I went for a very long time before I ac accepted the fact that um, something was wrong and that I really thank my daughters for it because 
you know, the early, um, what is the word? Early dementia. De early dementia. No, it's not the word that I'm looking for. I'm just an er early um, understanding that you have dementia is very important. And I also feel that it was really helpful to myself that um, I didn't cry. I didn't, I, 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 I thought, okay, this is happening. And I was very fortunate that I was able to express myself really openly to my daughters, to my close friends, and, and you know, most of all, to my husband, who is amazing. And I think that having a partner, um, which he has become, uh, is, is I'm, I have, I'm so blessed. And, you know, the Alzheimer's Association is so important for this disease. Um, and it is just, just for patients and caregivers. Uh, Alzheimer's Association is in every single county <laughs> across the nation. And if someone needs help in the middle of the night, uh, you can call the one of the uh, 800 number and there is always someone there to help which I think I very few organizations have that all all day all night you can get help and um, I've been working with the Alzheimer's Association and uh, doing things with them and the people who are uh, who are working to not only find a cure are also just uh, so willing to reach out and help. Well, you touched a very interesting um, memory of mine because we've known each other since 2008. And I remember that when you would forget things, um, you would get really nervous and very anxious. And what I've seen is, especially since I last saw you uh, last year, uh, after uh, you've been diagnosed, I think you have forgiven yourself in a way because I feel you were very tough on yourself when you were forgetting things. You were very impatient. You were, you wanted things to happen now, and you were upset with yourself that you were not remembering certain things. Yeah. And there is a big change, I feel, and 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 that is probably uh, important to not panic i guess and 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 you know if if somebody is noticing that there's you know early signs like that maybe to to go and check it out and 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 see and and uh, find out why it's happening well you are very smart and uh, you you actually pointed things out to me because i was if, if i couldn't find something i was furious at myself um, if I hadn't played exactly as I wanted to, I was really tense and uh, you were a great help uh, in, in that area. And I think the, the trick of not losing eyeglasses. My, of eyeglasses is to have 20 pairs around. You know? <laughs> it's, it's that kind of thing. Um, I, I do have doubles of a lot of things. <laughs> and, I, and I really don't know where things are. And it used to drive me crazy. I don't know. I, re I remember backstage with you, I was always, where's this? Oh, Milana, I've lost this. And uh, you were always, you know, sort of saying, chill. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Eugenia, when were you officially diagnosed? Three and I think a half years ago. Okay. Yeah, three and a half years ago. Maybe a little more. I, I can't can't really remember. But um, it hasn't gone, uh, you know, it, it's, I can't say that it's going faster and faster. I think that in many ways, because of my commitment to trying to help other people with it, um, and my, my need to be able to, uh, you know, help my, myself and my family, it's, it's, um, I, I feel that there's, there's still a lot ahead. Do you feel the key to all of this and, and, and having a, a fulfilling life with the disease is to 
uh, accepting and knowing the limitations and then working with limitations and, and kind of, let's say, yes, like you, you need 20 pairs of glasses around, you know, or making adjustments like that. Yeah, I, I think... I think that I am less uh, difficult on myself than I used to be because um, I also, uh, the, the, the tension that builds up when you're looking for something and can't find it is not healthy. And I think that is one thing that I have been better at uh, managing mm -hmm. because I uh, perfection was something that was... Uh, was expected in my household. My father was a, a genius, um, uh, and my my mother was a dancer with Martha Graham, and she was a great, uh, the first woman admitted to City College School of Engineering. So, you know, very highly um, functional people. And it was always uh, expected of me. And... Um, uh, you know, I, I, I don't have that anymore. My expectations are my expectations. There's nobody, you know, behind my shoulder saying, you should have done this, you should have done that, you know. In, and, and this might, might sound odd to say, but I, I am happier because I don't expect the, what I can't do. I don't expect what I can't do. And that helps. You bring up very interesting points. So your mother lived until she was 103 years old. Yes. Do you I can remember just one wonderful story about my mother? She was uh, in, her, in her last moments, and I was in a room alone with her, and I kept saying, Mama, it's me, it's Jeannie. And she didn't seem to know that anyone was in the room at all. And just suddenly she looked up, opened her eyes and she said, I know who you are and you're letting yourself go. <laughs> you know, I, I, that was it. That was her last words to me. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so now a question. Do you remember if um, you went to to check up on, on the Alzheimer's du during your mom's, like, was she still alive? Or was it after her death? To check up on my mother? Oh, no, 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 on your Alzheimer's. Oh, yeah. To I think it was after her death. But I think that I was already understanding that something was going on. Mm -hmm. I, I can't really remember, you know, how it was, but uh, she was in a, a very wonderful place in Massachusetts and um, well taken care of, etc. Also, I have a, a, a famous doctor sister who I always have gone to, and uh, she she is amazing. So I've had uh, a lot of ability to call the doctor and and uh, ask questions. Your mom made a major impression on me. I think she was about 99 years old when we went to play a little concert in the place where she stayed. And I just remember this person who was filled with energy and she was running, running around. Yeah. <laughs> and she was 99. And I remember I, I was just absolutely shocked that she had so much energy and, and charisma and was a very bubbly person. So it's uh, in, in, really incredible. Yeah. Yeah. So I will, uh, I will let others um, ask questions. There's one question. Um, um, does the Alzheimer's affect your ability to play concerts or remember complicated pieces from memory? As I said earlier on, I've never been able to uh, play from memory. Just mm -hmm. never. And it bothered me a lot um, in my young years, but um, I'm trying to remember the name of the pianist who I asked about because he always had the pianist, uh, the, the, the music up. Um, and uh, I wish I could remember exactly.